All right. Um, welcome everybody to the second half of the plenary session of today. And uh, we will now have two presentations on gravitational wave detection. The first uh, presentation will be by Harald Glück on future gravitational wave detectors in space and ground. He will have 25 minutes for his presentation and then we will dedicate five minutes on questions and answers. And for that later on, you can use the question and answer tool. Of course, feel free to already post questions during the talk, which we can read later on. Uh, so Harald, I would then ask you to take over and um, it's uh, you now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jan. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you well, very well, thanks. Okay. So I would like to give you a short uh, overview of uh, the future of gravitational wave observatories in space and ground. We are giving these presentations kind of in the wrong order. I'll first tell you about the future and then uh, Lisa will tell you about the present. Um, I already apologize that I will have to rush through it quite a bit because it's quite a topic uh, to cover ground and space in one short presentation. Um, let me see why it doesn't advance. Okay. So gravitational waves span an incredible wide frequency range uh, from wave periods at the left side here, as low as the lifetime uh, of the universe or as, as large as the lifetime of, of the universe up to kilohertz frequencies. And also with a variety of different sources and uh, physical phenomena to be studied by looking at these, at these sources. Um, the, uh, they do not only span a large frequency range, they also are quite dynamic in their, um, in their amplitude and the strength varies uh, by also by many orders. At uh, low frequencies, it is kind of uh, micro strains and uh, at the high frequencies, ground-based interferometers, you might call it yocto strain. So it's quite, quite a range. Um, starting at the low frequencies, um, the, uh, you have probably seen this famous uh, map of the B mode of the microwave background uh, observed by the South Pole uh, BICEP2 experiment. Um, for a while, it was thought that this might be an indication of gravitational waves, but it turned out that it's completely dominated by galactic dust foreground, not by gravitational waves. But future experiments aim at pushing the limits here um, of the gravitational wave contribution by a better foreground uh, mitigation, but so on that uh, scale, no gravitational waves have uh, been detected yet. If we go to um, periods of gravitational waves uh, of years, the technique of choice is pulsar timing. So neutron stars, rotating neutron stars often emit radio pulses, which can be observed on Earth by very sensitive radio telescopes. And uh, in pulsar timing, the excellent stability of the pulsing, the frequency timing stability of the pulsing of the rotating neutron star is exploited. And they, these pulsars provide an almost perfect reference clock. And the variation of the distance between the pulsar and the Earth, as indicated here in this, uh, in this animated graphic, uh, if caused by gravitational waves, or, or well, by anything else, they would show up in a change of arrival times of the pulses, which then can be analyzed. Um, and by correlating the pulse arrival times of a multitude of pulsars uh, from different directions, the fluctuations that result from other sources, like, for example, the individual telescopes timing errors there, or uh, by the influence of interstellar medium or something like this, they can be reduced. And uh, the expected signal from a gravitational wave then is given by what is uh, shown here in the lower left by the so-called Hellings down curve. And by comparing the observations of this multitude of pulsars um, with different uh, telescopes, the expe uh, the expe these expectations of the Helling down curve can be uh, compared with the observations and the existence of gravitational wave can be deduced. Um, the pulsar timing community is organized in various collaborations around the globe. Um, and uh, they are all contributing to the observations of many pulsars from, from many different directions. Uh, I've, I've listed the um, the collaborations here. So no detection has been made yet. Um, an excess noise in, in the low frequency range has been uh, observed. It's still unclear where that comes from. Um, but new telescopes, new radio telescopes, as uh, depicted here, mostly that uh, the, the, the biggest improvement will come from uh, SKA, 
um, they will boost the capabilities. And uh, to cite from an archive paper, PTA, so pulsar timing arrays, are expected to make gravitational wave detections within the next few years. And they will allow new and un unprecedented constraints on galaxy formation and evolution scenarios. And uh, as I mentioned, SKA, the square kilometer array, will add to the detection power enormously. So that uh, we can expect uh, some news in the, in the coming years. Moving up in frequency, we come to the spaceborne detectors. Uh, the target of the spaceborne detectors, gravitational wave detectors, is the millihertz frequency range that is too low for the ground-based detectors, which we will come to in a minute, and too high for, for pulsar timing. Uh, and in, in space, we can uh, set up huge structures, structures of very large size, millions of kilometers, and that allows to have very good strain sensitivity even though the displacement sensitivity that is achieved by the spaceborne gravitational wave detectors is uh, way um, uh, way uh, inferior to the ground-based ones. There are a few planned gravitational wave uh, missions, um, and I will just very briefly uh, present to you what uh, people have in mind there. Um, the, this sensitivity plot of the LISA um, mission shows what the detectors are aiming at. The frequency range, as I have mentioned, is from about 10 to the minus four hertz to the hundreds of millihertz range. In the high frequency range, it is limited by the arm length. So while the light travels along the arms, the uh, sign of the gravitational wave reverses multiple times and averages out the signal. At low frequencies, it is limited by force noise, by, by displacement of the test masses. And in the middle here, it is, uh, it is limited uh, by, by, the, by the short noise. The sensitivity goes down to about 10 to the minus 21. Um, I should point out here, it is not uh, what we typically show. It's not the spectral density, but it's characteristic strain. So it's averaged over either the expected lifetime of a signal or uh, of uh, the uh, measurement campaign. Um, some of the signals that will be observed with LISA will have uh, signal to noise ratios in the hundreds or even thousands. I mentioned that already. Um, some of the critical technologies uh, for LISA have already been tested. Um, there was the LISA Pathfinder mission that was kind of a shrunk down LISA version, two test masses aboard a satellite, uh, and the distance between it was interferometrically uh, measured. Um, that went very successful. Um, so micro-Newton thrusters and several other technologies have been measured, uh, have been tested there as well. And another mission that is successfully demonstrating interferometry in space, so the technology that will be used for gravitational wave detectors like LISA, is the GRACE follow-on mission. The GRACE follow-on mission is uh, a mission that uh, measures gravity, the, the gravitational potential, by measuring accurately the distance between two satellites um, spaced by 200 kilometers. That is also a very successful mission that shows that this technology is up to what is needed for uh, spaceborne gravitational wave detectors. This plot shows the sensitivity goals of the LISA Pathfinder mission. Up here, you, show, uh, you see the requirements of LISA Pathfinder. And down here, you can see what has been achieved. So the achievement was even below the LISA, the final LISA uh, requirement. Um, we, we don't have to go into what, what limited the, the noise sources um, here. Another uh, mission that, uh, another uh, potential project that is centered around the Chinese Academ Academy of Sciences is the Tai Chi uh, mission. It is similar um, to the LISA one. It is also um, a heliocentric uh, orbit um, of uh, 3 million kilometers uh, arm length, uh, which reminds me that I forgot uh, to explain uh, this part here. So LISA is, uh, consists of three uh, satellites having uh, free-falling test masses in, in uh, their middle. Um, the distance is measured by uh, laser interferometry. Um, it's on a heliocentric orbit, um, two, two and a half kilometers arm length and following the Earth by about uh, 50 million kilometers. Um, the launch of LISA is expected in the mid-30s, uh, 2030s. Mission lifetime is nominally four years, can be extended to 10 years, um, and it is uh, an ESA-led mission with uh, NASA contributions. 
Um, so back to, to Tai Chi. Uh, tai Chi is a similar uh, mission, 3 million kilometers arm length, also interferometric uh, detection. Um, a, a similar um, a similar launch and, and lifetime. Um, there has been uh, also a Pathfinder mission, uh, Tai Chi 1. Um, it consisted of a single satellite. Um, it was declared uh, a big success. Uh, displacement noises is uh, shown here in in this graph, there is planned to be a second mission, Tai G2, that then consists of uh, two satellites. The final launch uh, of the uh, Tai G mission is also foreseen for the mid 2030s. And uh, if the timing of both missions goes uh, as expected, then there would be a small network, a Lisa Tai G network one uh, of the triangles uh, leading and the other trailing the Earth on its orbit around the sun. That will significantly improve sky localization of uh, coalescing massive black hole binaries. Another mission of the Chinese is the uh, Tianjin. Um, that is in a, uh, in a, in a geocentric uh, orbit. It, uh, it has a spacing between the spacecraft of 170,000 kilometers. Um, the, the sensitivity aimed at is shown here. Uh, it is worse, uh, the, the uh, sensitivity would be worse at low frequencies, a bit better at, at high frequencies. And the projected uh, goal at the, in the bucket is about the same. Um, there has also been a um, Pathfinder mission, a satellite had been launched, a, a Tianjin satellite had been launched in December 2019, uh, also demonstrating local laser interferometry in space, free floating test masses, track free control, and the achieved sensitivity is shown in this, in this plot down here and uh, some, some links for those who want to go in a bit further. So the sensitivities uh, that can be uh, achieved uh, with these uh, missions that we have seen so far at the very low frequencies here, the pulsar timing, here the LISA and LISA-like missions, and uh, what we'll come to in a minute, the ground-based one. In between the gap, uh, there is a project to cover this gap, and that is the desigo desi hertz gravitational wave observatory, so an attempt to bridge the gap between the spaceborne and the ground-based one. Um, the, um, yeah, so um, there are some, uh, some uh, links here as well for those who want to, uh, who want to look uh, into more details. Um, in, in the full version of the uh, projected, uh, of, of, the, of the aimed at project, uh, there would be two stages um, and the final, the final stage would consist of four such triangles of, um, of, of satellites um, for full uh, resolution of um, full, full uh, directional resolution of, of the sources. Yeah. Coming to the ground based detectors, um, I already mentioned that uh, right after my talk, Lisa uh, Basotti will give a talk on the current status of ground based uh, detectors. Um, so I will just very quickly go uh, over uh, what we've got at present. At present, we've got uh, three very sensitive instruments, the two LIGO ones, the Virgo one, uh, the Kagra one uh, underground is upcoming, and there is the Geo 600 one uh, in Germany. These two are uh, quite inferior in terms of sensitivity to the other uh, three. We had a series of uh, observation uh, runs. The, uh, sensitivity of the detectors was uh, was increased between uh, all the all the different uh, observation runs. The detection of the first gravitational wave, GW fifteen oh nine fourteen, was right at the beginning uh, of the first uh, observation run. Um, sensitivities that are achieved now uh, are uh, very impressive and. Uh, Due to the corona pandemic, uh, the start of the next observation run will be a little bit delayed. Um, it will not start before August 2022. Details on the timing will probably be released uh, in about a month's time. Um, 
a lot of detections, especially um, of uh, black hole binaries, merging black hole binaries have been made. This is the results from the first two observation runs and with the increased sensitivity in the third observation run, uh, the rate, so the slope of the cumulative uh, events that are depicted here increased dramatically. That is the catalog that had been uh, released some time ago. Um, the uh, second half of this third observation run uh, has been analyzed. A uh, paper is being written and uh, will, will shortly be, be released, will be published pretty soon. Lisa will tell you a little bit more about this. It has been a firework of observations throughout these, uh, these data taking runs. Um, you will have heard uh, about lots of them. Um, some highlights was the, uh, for example, the merging of two neutron stars, which revealed interesting uh, physics uh, way too much than, uh, than uh, what we can go uh, into here. And yet, um, this has only been the beginning. So again, uh, here are the current, the sensitivities of the current instruments. Um, which show that gravitational wave astronomy reveals uh, lots of scientific news, lots of uh, interesting new insights. So we want to go for more sensitivity. We want to increase the sensitivity with the next generation of gravitational wave detectors by an order of magnitude beyond uh, what, uh, what is the, the design goal for now. That will be done in several stages. And what we are generally aiming at is something like this, we'll see in a minute. Uh, so about an order of magnitude better sensitivity and also expanded uh, to, the low, to, to the low frequency. And one of these projects, the European one, um, is the Einstein telescope uh, project. It is an underground uh, facility about two to 300 meters underground, to an equilateral triangle, 10 kilometers uh, side. Um, we had started uh, looking into this and, uh, and performed the con conceptual design study uh, between 2008 and 2011. We have now updated this design. You can see the links here and uh, have a more uh, de detailed look if you like. Um, the, the project had been submitted uh, for the ESFRI, the European Strategy Forum of Research Infrastructures uh, roadmap, and it was uh, selected, so it was successfully selected. Um, we, will, um, we will update the technical design uh, reports throughout the next years. And our next step, uh, our next formal step is uh, to form the uh, Einstein Telescope collaboration. From the technological side, um, the, we split the, uh, each detector uh, of the Einstein Telescope. So it, it's a triangular one consisting of three, um, three detectors. Um, they are redundant. The third detector gives the same information as other two. So we will have um, some uh, options in data uh, processing. And each of the detectors will consist of two interferometers, one optimized for low frequencies at cry operated partly at cryogenic temperatures, one optimized for high frequencies that uses more or less the standard techniques that, are, that we are familiar with at the moment. And the combination of the two Sensitivity curves here, the low frequency one, and here the high frequency one, gives the final sensitivity curve depicted in red here for the Einstein telescope. Um, the current situation, um, there are two, um, two site candidates. One is at, on the island of uh, Sardinia, and the other one is in this little appendix of the Netherlands here, the Limburg region, surrounded by Germany and, and Belgium. Geological and seismic properties uh, of the two sites are currently being analyzed. And uh, this, an this analysis and the, the site investigations will continue to go on over the next few years. And uh, at the end, towards the end of 2024, beginning of 2025, um, we plan to take a site selection, a site decision with which uh, site the Einstein telescope uh, should be built on. In the meantime, geological surveys are going on. Uh, this uh, shows a little bit of the um, efforts that is going on in the Limburg region. Um, there is a borehole where a sensor has been lowered to 250 meters. 
you can, if you click this link here, if you um, use this link, you can see live data of the sensor. But in addition, large arrays of uh, seismometers have been deployed to take uh, passive and also active, so with vibro-sized trucks and explosives um, me measurements to look into the ground and see um, what, the, what the geology there is. Um, in general, the, the seismic noise level um, at a depth of 250 meters is uh, significantly reduced with respect to above ground. At, at the top, there is a soft top layer with excellent damping with a strength of a few tens of meters. And down there, there is hard rock, um, which is very good for tunnel construction and the impedance mismatch allows uh, significant seismic reduction from surface sources. Similar measurements are going on in Sardinia. Um, Sos Enatos uh, is uh, the name of a mine on, on Sardinia, which allows very good uh, um, exploration of the seismic conditions underground there. Um, there are also um, boreholes being drilled to lower seismometers at various places, check the geology, check the seismicity there. Um, the seismic at, uh, on Sardinia is pretty low. You can see that it uh, partly approaches the uh, Peterson low, uh, low noise limit uh, rather closely. And also tilt noise as shown in these two graphs here is significantly reduced with respect to uh, on-surface uh, on surface sites. We are currently uh, setting up the governance of the Einstein Telescope project. Um, there, there is a more, more project-oriented uh, section uh, run by, by a project directorate and, and the council. And there is the ET collaboration that takes more care of the research and the technical um, aspect. Um, it's, it, we have divided it in several boards, like for example, an instrument science board that takes care of all the instrument aspects, observational science board, as the name says, that looks into how to extract physical information from the data collected with the Einstein telescope. That is, uh, currently uh, being being set up. Um, if you're interested, uh, three minutes. I know. Thank you. Um, if you're interested in joining, um, then you can check out uh, the web pages here. Um, either if you're on the instrumental side or the uh, observational, the data analysis uh, analysis side. Concerning the project timeline, I mentioned uh, that uh, we want to decide on the site uh, in 2024-25. Construction um, would take, depending on exactly how we do it, between uh, six and eight years, such that uh, we would hope to have first data taking with the first detectors in the mid of the 30s. Another um, third generation, next generation instrument is uh, Cosmic Explorer, um, built in the or planned in the US. Uh, this one is planned to be above ground on two sides, uh, significantly larger detectors, 40 kilometers, and the other one 20 kilometers, um, to have a decent sensitivity in, at high frequencies as well. Um, in the first phase, it would be based on the current technology that is so, so successful with the current detectors now. And phase two would be either an expansion of the current technologies or going to new technologies, cryogenic optics, longer wavelengths, and so on. Um, some of the parameters are shown in this table here. In general, it's a standard, more or less standard layout of the gravitation wave detector. The sensitivities that are aimed at are shown here. So the bucket is at about two times 10 to the minus 25 at, uh, per root hertz uh, at frequencies from a few 10 hertz or pro say from, from 10 ish hertz to a few kilohertz. So um, in, the, um, in the 3G era, we then hope to uh, have reached this aimed at sensitivity that I showed earlier with the Einstein telescope and with Cosmic Explorer. Um, um, there would be two detectors of uh, two Cosmic Explorer detectors in the United States and uh, one Einstein telescope in uh, Europe. And maybe there would be a third detector um, in uh, Australia there is a project that aims at especially the high frequencies, which is interesting for neutron stars. 
we would reach the full cosmos uh, with this. The reach of uh, these detectors would go up to a redshift of 100, which allows to look into the dark ages, see whether there are primordial uh, black holes. So we would see further out, we would see back in time, um, and that would uh, allow us to look at uh, completely new phenomena. We also want to broaden the, uh, the, the community um, especially the mergers of the neutron stars have shown that there is a wide interest in the astronomical community. So combining the information from neutrino telescopes, from uh, electromagnetic telescopes and gravitational wave observatories will uh, benefit the, the whole, whole community. Um, so that is what we will have in the future in the late 30s, all these uh, nice ways of seeing gravitational waves over a wide range of, uh, of frequencies from, uh, the, uh, from below nanohertz uh, to, to the kilohertz range. And uh, I would like to close with uh, showing you a few impressions, a few visual impressions of the uh, Einstein telescope uh, while uh, we are getting the questions. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Harald, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, so the way, uh, if, if you don't know yet, the way to ask questions is through the questions and answers tool that you can find at the um, bar, at the bottom bar of the of your Zoom window. So um, I would ask you to ask the questions there, write down your questions there, and I will then read the uh, selected ones. Um, Maybe in the meantime, I can ask a question. So Harald, um, there are the current detectors and some of these infrastructures are older. Uh, so LIGO and Virgo especially. So what do you think, what the role of these detectors will be um, in the future? What do you think and maybe others think what, what the role of these detectors will be in the future together, well, maybe into the 3G era? Yeah, these detectors uh, in the infrastructures that we are using now will be upgraded to the technological limits. Uh, I didn't have time to go into the options that, that there are. Um, the sensitivity of these detectors can still be improved by a factor of a few, but then they will hit infrastructural limits. Um, and as you said, um, also the, uh, the, the, the lifetime of the infrastructure is limited. Uh, initially, uh, while the 3G detectors will ramp up in sensitivity, the second generation, the current generation and their upgrades will have an important role in pinpointing the direction of the, of the source with the single detector. And uh, they, of course, the, the 3G detectors won't all come up uh, at once and take data. The uh, current generation will have an important uh, role in, in pinpointing the direction of the source, for example. Eventually, when uh, the 3G network is on the two, uh, the, the current uh, detectors and their improved versions will, will, be, uh, will be shut down. Okay, thank you very much. There's also a question I want to read for you. Um, if Cosmic Explorer can do it above ground, why ET wants to go below? Tunnels are expensive. So it's a good common question. What is the answer? Tunnels are very expensive. Um, above ground, um, it is uh, impossible to go to very low frequencies. Um, the One of the limits to go to low frequency is the so-called Newtonian noise, gravity gradient noise, um, which means a direct coupling, a gravitational coupling between moving masses around the detectors and the test masses. Um, above ground, um, there is a big, uh, a, a big difference in density between the ground and the air, such that when uh, seismic waves, wave comes from one side, you've got much more mass on one side, and when it travels to the other side, it's on the other side. Going to a location where seismic movement is less underground and where the environment is more homogeneous, also underground, you can cut down this effect, you can cut down this noise source. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we want to go 
underground with ET. Another reason is that we uh, envisage to build uh, ET in Europe, and in Europe, uh, it is, if not impossible, then at least extremely hard to find sites where you can build 40 kilometer long detectors. These are the two main reasons. Right, thank you. Thank you, Harald. I think at this point we have to um, go over to the next presentation. Let me just say, if people have more questions, then they can always use the forum of the plenary session to post their question there um, and uh, people might have a look later. There will also be a discussion panel at the end here, uh, in, in a, uh, well, not in this session, but there will be a discussion panel later on after this plenary session. So now the next presentation will be by Lisa Brasotti on gravitational waves, technology and current detectors. So Lisa, if you could share your screen, perfect. It's there, so it's all yours. You Hello, okay. can you, can you hear you me? Are. Yes. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to give these talks. My job is uh, much simpler. Uh, than the one that Harald had. So my job is to discuss the current status of ground-based gravitational wave detectors and give you a sense of the technology that we are working on right now to make these detectors more, more sensitive. Okay, I'm going to start with a similar slide, um, the one that Harald uh, started with. Um, just to put in context, uh, right now, we are in this talk, we're focusing on uh, ground-based interferometers and uh, the um, frequency of operation in the gravitational wave spectrum is around the um, audio, uh, audio frequency. And, and so between 10 hertz and a few kilohertz. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about in, uh, right now. Okay. Um, this is the uh, ground-based gravitational wave worldwide network um, today and uh, hopefully uh, with uh, one more detector uh, we'll, we'll join uh, before the end of the decade. So from, the, from left to right, you see the two uh, LIGO instruments, one in uh, Washington State, one in Louisiana, uh, the Virgo uh, detector in Italy, uh, the geo detector in Germany, and uh, the first underground detector Kagra in Japan, and as I said, hopefully uh, by the end of the of the decade, we'll have uh, another LIGO detector in India. Um, there has been two excellent talks yesterday on the science that gravitational wave detectors have produced so far, and Harald also mentioned some of the highlights from the past observing run. We started in uh, we call it O3. We started in April first, two thousand nineteen and ended about a month earlier than expected due to the impact of the COVID pandemic, unfortunately. Um, the canonical uh, figure of merit for these detectors is how far in the sky they can reach. Um, and we use a canonical source as a binary neutron star system. And so here you see the last five months of the run. Um, and here is the, is the uh, neutron star inspired range. So the Livingston detector, we call it L1, was the most sensitive detector around 130 megaparsec, and then Hanford around 110, and then the Virgo detector that uh, improved up to 50 megaparsec in the course of the run. So most of the science results that you have seen come from um, from these three detectors. Uh, it was a very important milestone that was reached shortly after the end of O3. We, we call it O3GK, is a run that the GEO detector in Germany and the Kagra detector did jointly in April. Um, this was important for two reasons, despite the fact that the sensitivity of the two instruments was significantly lower than LIGO and Virgo. Uh, this run um, uh, was the first time that an underground detector, Kagra, was operational on one hand. On the other hand, I was very, very impressed to see that GEO uh, was able to run. This is the control room of GEO. It was able to run with no one um, present on site, um, given how, how well they have automat automatized their, their system. Uh, this is even more impressive if you actually spent a, a bit of time going to the detail of how this uh, interferometer works. So you have a laser source. Uh, all of the detectors right now operate at 
1064 nanometer. And uh, here I take the limestone detector as an example. In O3, uh, there were about 40 watts of laser, um, laser light injected into the interferometer. And thanks to the recycling gain of, the, of this coupled cavity system, Livingston had about 230 kilowatt laser power inside the arms. Um, the uh, optics of these interferometers are very high quality fused silica mirrors for LIGO and Virgo and Sapphire for Kagra. They are isolated from the ground. Uh, each detector has a, a peculiar seismic and uh, suspension isolation system, but the common aspect is it's very, very performing. And so the idea is to isolate the mirrors from the motion of the ground. And, and this is a, has a uh, important, this is a fundamental limit at the low frequencies due by uh, the seismic motion of the, of the ground. So the, this is a quite different control room <laughs> uh, from the one of Geo. There are usually uh, uh, several people. This is during the commissioning phase when you, know, the, you need to um, make sure that all the components work well at, at the same time, and it's a quite complicated. Uh, the important piece of information is that the passage of gravitational waves create a relative displacement between the mirrors of the interferometer. And you sense that as a change in interference pattern at the output part of the detector, where you have a, a photodetector uh, that sends this uh, change in the amplitude of, of the light. And uh, the signal that is the, you detected at this photodetector is the sum of the gravitational waves uh, plus the interferometer noise. And so most of the work that uh, experimentalists working in this project do is to try to make sure that the interferometer noise is as low as possible, because the lower the noise, the, uh, the, the, the better is your detector, and you can uh, detect more gravitational waves and with higher signal-to-noise ratio. So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to uh, uh, it's some, somewhat, uh, it's a funny, um, step in which you go from the uh, exciting science and then what you end up talking about is noise, but uh, noise has a crucial role in, in, in these instruments. And here it is. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the LIGO Livingstone interferometer as an example, uh, but that's pretty much a similar story for all of them. Uh, this is how we characterize the noise of our instrument. So this is in this plot on the y-axis is displacement in meters, so a meter of the square root of Earth, and the, the x-axis is frequency. Uh, so this plot summarizes our knowledge of the instrument. So let's start. It's, it's very busy, but I just want to point out a few things. So on the left is what I mentioned earlier. We call it the seismic wall. Uh, so the sensitivity cannot go uh, too far down for the current instrument, uh, the, 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 the wall is around 10 hertz. This blue trace is the measured noise of the instrument, uh, while all the other traces are either technical noises or what we call fundamental noises of the instrument, either based on direct measurements or calculations. And now if you look very closely at this green, trace here, this is the sum of our understanding. And so what this plot says is that at high frequency, uh, which in, in, for ground-based detector means above 100 hertz, we understand our instrument very well. And in fact, the green trace and the blue trace overlap nicely. At low frequency, uh, there is a, a bit of a, a gap. And uh, usually that, that means that there are un unidentified noises. So below, what you see, they're mostly control noise of the instruments that they're needed to keep the mirror, for example, um, very well aligned with respect to each other. Um, and the, the relative length of the mirror is controlled. Um, and then there is, again, this gap uh, that we haven't quite yet understood. So I just, this is the complexity that I didn't want to hide, but now uh, to move forward, I want to focus on uh, what they are, the fundamental noises. So in the, in, the, um, in the process of making more sensitive detectors, on one hand, you want to reduce your technical noises, control noises. Uh, on the other hand, you want to make uh, fundamental improvements uh, to your instrument to address mostly two uh, noises that we call quantum noise and thermal noise. I'm going to start with the thermal noise. 
so all current detectors are limited by uh, the Brownian motion of the molecules of the coatings that are um, on the on the surface of the of the mirrors of the optics. This coating noise is proportional to the square root of the mechanical loss of the mirror material that makes the coating and the square root of the temperature. And so from this, you can already see that the obvious way to make coating thermal noise lower is to find better materials that have lower mechanical loss. And if you can decrease the temperature, like when Virgo operate at room temperature, while Kagra will operate at uh, cryogenic temperature with the goal being uh, 20 Kelvin. Quantum noise. Quantum noise, I, I just say it up front, so that I'm very biased. That's my fundamental noise. My favorite noise is the noise that I've, I've worked on for uh, um, most of the last 10 years. Um, so quantum noise comes in two flavors. At high frequency, we call it shot noise. It's the same shot noise that you find in um, many tabletop experiments. Uh, one way to explain it is to think as the uncertainty in, in the arrival time of the photons at the uh, output of the interferometer. Um, this noise is, uh, goes as one over the square root of the laser power stored in the arms of the interferometer. And so the obvious way to make your interferometer better is to increase the power. Now, when you do that, then you go at low frequency and uh, quantum noise comes in another flavor, which is radiation pressure noise. Uh, and be careful, this is not uh, classical radiation pressure noise. This is quantum radiation pressure noise. So this is the noise that is due to the uncertainty in the uh, momentum of the photons impinging upon the test masses, which is you know, very hard to produce. I mean, very hard to make quantum uh, uh, radiation pressure noise in the lab, but in this large instrument, unfortunately, we get it for free. Um, so this noise, uh, quite inconveniently, scales proportionally to the square root of the power. So we have this problem that on one hand, you know, to improve the high frequency, you want to inject as much power as possible, but then what you get is that then your low frequency gets worse. Uh, so you can kind of balance and find an optimum by um, uh, considering the fact that you can also increase the mass uh, of your mirrors. And, and since radiation pressure noise scales with one over the mass, you can win somehow. Practically, uh, in the design of the current detectors, what we did is we picked the largest mass we could conveniently make. Um, and then we, had, and we adjust the power accordingly. OK, so this is quite of a long explanation, but this gives you all the ingredients uh, to understand uh, the, what we are working on right now and what's the path to make these detectors better. So uh, as I told you, um, Livingston operated with about 230 kilowatts in the arms. So this is this, 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 um, this P here. Uh, the goal for, uh, for LIGO is three times that. So one obvious uh, path forward to reach the design sensitivity of these detectors is to in increase the amount of power. Uh, that's not straightforward, and I will explain later why. Another approach that is not captured in this, in this plot is to use quantum optics to help us reduce quantum noise. And so this is the first technology I highlight uh, in my talk. Um, so I, I explain quantum noise uh, from the perspective of the photons, uh, but there is a way more powerful way that um, caves and others in the AP appreciated. Uh, so the quantum noise in gravitational in interferometers, in laser interferometers in general, um, can be explained as uh, the zero point energy uh, uh, vacuum fluctuations entering your interferometer uh, from all the open ports. And then it turns out that the ports that actually matter is the one, uh, it, it, it's the anti-symmetric port uh, or, or, or dark port. Uh, so even when there is no, uh, even when your electric magnetic field is zero and there is no, uh, and the average amplitude is zero, there is still uh, vacuum fluctuations that enters your detector. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, so the, the, the concept is that these vacuum fluctuations have uncertainty in the amplitude and phase. Uh, and then when they beat with the, what we, we call local oscillators or the light, uh, 
the, the actual uh, light in your interferometer produce this quantum noise. Uh, and this amplitude and phase of uh, the vacuum fluctuations obey the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this um, uh, picture, which is complicated the first time you're here, uh, has a, a, a very powerful implication, which is that you can change uh, this vacuum fluctuation, you can squeeze them to make it such that the noise in the, let's say you, you care about phase, so the noise in the phase is lower uh, at the expense of increasing the noise in, in the amplitude. Uh, and so that's what we call this technology squeezing because that's what it does, it squeezes the vacuum fluctuations that enters your detector. You pretty much are replacing the random vacuum fluctuations with fluctuation that you produce that are squeezed. Um, so there is not, no magic. The, the physical object that you use is a crystal with a strong uh, second order polarization component. This is the picture of the, a device that was uh, built by the Australian uh, National University for one of the first prototypes that we built. Um, so you don't violate any uh, physical law because the vacuum fluctuations obey the uh, Eisenberg uncertainty principle. So again, the noise gets uh, smaller in one, uh, we say quadrature, so let's say phase at the expense of the amplitude. But the, if you measure the signal of your interference, you measure it in phase, that's you win. And I can go back and forth to, to show you, if you look at this ball and the stick, that's the picture that uh, makes it a bit clear. So the noise in the, let's say, direction that you care gets smaller. Uh, so this, again, sounds like strange, but it actually works. Uh, and so the O3 run is the first run that saw um, LIGO, Virgo, and GEO all at the same time operating with squeeze light. Um, and so I, let me start from the bottom left. See, this is the performance of the GEO detector. Uh, so GEO has pioneered squeezing technology for many years, I think 2009, 2010. So it's been operating with squeezing for 10 years and optimiz optimizing the performance. So what squeezing does for you is that it reduces in this detector, it reduces shot noise. So you, you recall in, in, in my previous plot, shot noise is at the high frequency. And so this is the blue trace without squeezing. And then what's happened when you increase, uh, when you turn your squeezer on and you inject squeeze light. And now if you go on the top, this is the LIGO performance. So in black is the noise of the instrument without squeezing and green is when squeezing turns on and, and the black and, and, and red are the same traces for Virgo. So Virgo and LIGO um, uh, saw about 3 dB of squeezing that corresponds to 40% reduction in the quantum noise. And this is uh, actually huge because you will need I told you that the noise scales are the square root of the power, so you need to double the power to achieve that, and it's not easy to do. And, and, and GEO obtaining net 60 dB is a factor of two improvement, uh, so you would have need to in, in, increase the power by a factor of four uh, to achieve the same result. The important thing is the in, impact of squeezing um, is in this detector, as you see, it is only positive in the sense that you make your noise lower. But I told you, Eisenberg uncertainty principle, what happens is if you actually start increasing the amount of squeezing that you see, you would start seeing noise at low frequency uh, due to the quantum radiation pressure noise. And in fact, both LIGO and Virgo observed this effect, and then we kind of tuned the, the amount of squeezing that you produce to um, not make this noise uh, a, a, very high, at least comparable to the control noises, that the other control noises. So as usual, when I talk about squeezing, I spend too much time, so now let me uh, move on. But uh, this is important to understand what LIGO and Virgo are doing now to improve the detectors. So instrument challenges. Here I'm trying to summarize uh, what the O3 observing run showed us. Um, and so they're kind of ge generic for all interferometers. And then there are some uh, specific problems that we observe in LIGO that um, I, th I think are interesting. So all the interferometers are limited by quantum radiation pressure noise, as I said. And so this idea that we can keep increasing the power and then also add squeezing 
uh, doesn't work anymore unless you do something different. And this different thing is a frequency dependent squeezing. So it's a manipulation of the squeezing that allows you to win not only at high frequency, but also low frequency below 100 Hertz. And I will talk a bit more about that. Uh, it's difficult to operate interferometers at high power. I told you none of the interferometers is right now operating at the design power. It's still for light is three times lower, for Virgo is even lower. Uh, there are several control problems generated by having high circulating power in interferometer arms. Um, and we knew that. Uh, the thing that we are discovering in LIGO is that there are also point absorbers in the main interferometer optics that complicate high power operations. And I will have a few details about that. There are technical and non noises below 40 years. And this is an ongoing work to try to make this, to understand all the noises and, and make it lower. And then I, I mentioned earlier, there is this coating thermal noise. This is a fundamental limit in the bucket. And there are pretty much two, there are three ways, but I mentioned two. One is uh, going to cryogenic temperature and the other one is uh, find better materials. And so for LIGO and Virgo, there is a um, large group of people that right now is trying to uh, focus on that and, and find um, uh, materials for the coatings with lower mechanical loss. Okay, so with all of this, uh, the next step for, uh, for LIGO and Virgo um, is to double the original advanced LIGO and Virgo design sensitivity with uh, two new detectors that we called advanced LIGO plus, A plus, and uh, advanced Virgo plus. Uh, the way in which we are going to do that is in two steps. So in the next observing run, uh, both LIGO and Virgo are going to deploy frequency dependent squeezing, which is this manipulation of the squeezing that allows you to win both at low frequency and high frequency. So broadband improvement in quantum noise, coupled with higher power. So approaching the design power for this detector. And then there will be, um, at least the way we understand it now, there will be a, a next step uh, in the following run where we, by then we'll have uh, hopefully uh, better mirror coatings um, and we will operate at the full power of these detectors and then both LIGO and Virgo will have specific improvements that we will pursue. Uh, Harold already uh, mentioned the 04 timeline. That's the usual question is when is 04 starting? Um, so it, it, the original, the, the official wording is not before August 22, which I summarized as expected to start in the second half of 2022. Uh, there is a public timeline page that LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra maintain. Uh, and uh, there, there is a promise for a timeline update by September 15. Um, as you all know, uh, the United States uh, has been uh, hit pretty hard by the pandemic. And right now, uh, unfortunately, the areas where both sides are located is, um, is uh, um, very, very uh, impacted. So uh, without mentioning hurricanes and other catastrophes. So we, we, we'll see. Uh, you, you also have seen this, this plot summarize what I've just said. Uh, this is the, the timeline for LIGO Virgo um, and with Kagran and LIGO India as well. Um, I want to mention that, as uh, uh, Harold uh, show you, we're here. Uh, the next uh, observing round of four, we see a significant improvement in the sensitivity for both LIGO and Virgo. And then uh, the, the O5 is uh, ideally reaching the full potential of these uh, A plus and adv advanced Virgo plus detectors. There is work in progress in, at both, in both collaborations in LIGO and Virgo to um, uh, kind of clarify and, and define the post O5 plans. And all of this information is in the public uh, observing scenario that the collaborations um, maintain. So this is again a summary. Uh, now the, uh, the, the plot that I uh, showed earlier in displacement in frequencies converted in um, detector noise expressed as equivalent gravitational wave strain. And so this is the progression from LIGO and Virgo. I start with Virgo, you see the in blue is the O2, green O3. So this is the past run. And then you see that in O4 expect a significant uh, improvement in the sensitivity. So the, the lower the noise, uh, uh, the better. Um, and the, the full potential reached in 05. 
and then for uh, for LIGO, it's, uh, the plot is a bit busier because you see the O1 and O2. So those are better sensitivity. The best sensitivity is rich in O1 and O2. And then um, green and uh, orange are the sensitivity of the Limiston and Hanford detector. And then you see that then the gray trace O4 is an improvement on, on that for both detectors where you, you see the um, frequency dependent squeezing that should lower the quantum noise um, here. And the same thing for, for Virgo. Isa, there are one, two minutes left. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to make it. <laughs> uh, so a few, uh, I mentioned earlier, the difficulties in operating in high power. Um, so LIGO operated so far with 200, 230 kilowatts. Uh, the, the goal for O4 for LIGO is to double the, the amount of, uh, of power stored in the arms. We, not, we observed in the past runs uh, point absorbers. So these are elements of uh, 10, 20 micron diameters. Uh, that prevent stable uh, power operations. And we, those are coating defects uh, and uh, they are hit but when we run at high power, uh, the, they kind of uh, provide thermoelastic deformation and then it makes hard to maintain the um, uh, good mode matching of, of, of the system. So this uh, a point absorber was the main problem, main reason why the Hanford detector was operating at lower sensitivity than the Livingstone detector in O3. Uh, the good news is uh, since then, this mirror was replaced and now the uh, Hanford performance is significantly improved with respect to the O3 one. So that's a, that's a good news, but uh, we are working on long-term solution to have absorber free mirrors and this will have an important impact both in LIGO and Virgo. I talk a lot about squeezing, so we'll go faster, but now you understand that um, I told you now we want to do frequency dependent squeezing, so we want to manipulate the squeeze light to win at, uh, at all frequency. The way in which we plan to do this is by um, building a filter cavity, uh, which, which is it's going to be a 300 meter cavity spot for LIGO and Virgo in which you bounce off your squeeze light before injecting into the interferometer, the filter cap is detuned. And in this configuration, it allow, this configuration allows you to manipulate the squeezing ellipse in, as a function of frequency and win uh, broadband. Proof of principle of this has been uh, demonstrated in Japan in the uh, Tama 300 meter cavity and in our labs at MIT on the 16 meter cavity. And uh, very good news from Virgo is that they already built this system and they already locked this cavity. And so they are working on integrating this um, the filter cavity with the interferometer. Situation for um, LIGO, uh, we are a bit behind um, because we cannot build this, uh, this, this cavity within the same enclosure uh, as, the, uh, as the main arm. So we need to, to build uh, new buildings for doing that. Um, but here is the, uh, this chamber. This is a very recent from last week from the Hanford Observatories. Uh, this is the, the chamber that hosts the input mirrors of the filter cavity. And here is our in-button squeezer that sits next to it. So there is good progress. Last slide before uh, closing. Um, I won't talk much about this, but I want to point out that I, I mentioned earlier and another approach to reduce coating thermal noise is to go cryogenics. That's the design for the Kagda detector. The goal is to reach 20 Kelvin. There is a concept in LIGO that we call LIGO Voyager um, that uses the same idea, uh, going to you know, changing the material of the masses, going to silicon and uh, using radiative cooling to reach 123 Kelvin. With that, um, message of my slide, uh, of my presentation. So gravitational wave detector will be upgraded to come back online more sensitive in the next observing round of four. Uh, main new technologies as well increasing the power and frequency dependent squeezing. That's already installed and under commissioning in Virgo, which is great, and uh, infrastructure under construction in LIGO. Stay tuned for updates on the O4 timeline, expected to start second half of 22, 2022. Official wording now is not before August 22. This evolving schedule, um, as I said, the United States has, uh, we have seen already set, uh, uh, impact of the 
a severe impact of the COVID pandemic. And uh, so next time line update would be by September 15. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, any questions, please again, type them in the questions and answers tool. Maybe I can uh, quickly answer, uh, ask my, my, my first question. So, so you were showing geo 60B improvement because of squeezing, but then you see papers where people you know, talk about 15 dB and maybe higher. So what is the story? So why, why don't we uh, do that? And why uh, is it hard to get to 15 dB in gravitational wave detectors? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. Um, yeah, so well, I know you, you do know, know the answer, but I, I, I'm going with the, uh, the, the explanation. So uh, squeezing is affected by loss. So the squeeze beam uh, goes through several optics to, and the interferometer itself to reach the um, uh, output photo detector. Any loss uh, in this path um, reduce the amount of squeezing that you, you observe. So even if you produce a lot of squeezing and all of the squeezer with geo, for LIGO, for Virgo can produce up to 20 dB, um, then as soon as you, uh, you send your squeeze beam in a complicated optical system, the amount of squeezing that you observe is lower. So Virgo, uh, as I said, Virgo, uh, LIGO serve 3 dB. Uh, geo spent many years to, uh, you know, chase and find all the losses and reach six. Uh, the goal um, that I think is reachable, and let me explain, loss, I mean, a loss in your Faraday isolators and loss in your optical components. And those are in some sense, the easy one. And then there are the difficult ones, which are mode matching loss. And when you have to mode match your squeeze beam to a complicated, uh, Interferometer is, is not like your simple table where you can move things around very easily. So we are actually building technology. I didn't mention, I didn't have time to talk about, it, but we're building technology to make um, mode matching um, easier to do with uh, uh, actuators that we can control remotely. Long explanation, the short, short answer, I think we can do 10. Uh, for um, the for the three for the next generation of detector, I think ten is reachable if there is a focused effort. If like we continue doing what we're doing, uh, which is understand our loss, understand how the squeezer works with the interferometer, I think we can reach ten. Fifteen, I don't see it happening um, for quite a long time. Thank you very much. Well, let's yeah. cross our fingers for 10 dB then. I think 10 is doable. Okay. Because with 10 dB, you need pretty much 10% loss. Um, yeah. And I think that is, is, is doable. All right. Good. Um, thank you very much, Lisa. I think we are running out of time. Uh, I want then to end this plenary session. Thank you again to Harald and Lisa for your great presentations. And uh, again, people who have not asked the questions, please use the forum for the plenary session to still post them. And uh, then good evening and good day to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.